people don't want to serve on the front line. They're running away. Um, more tragically, Israelis are committing suicide rather than report to active duty. Um, this is the state of affairs. Domestically, Benjamin Netanyahu is a failed leader. Um, a story that's not getting much attention. Uh, Seymour Hirsch in his um, very good Substack just published a piece, talked about just how much trouble Benjamin Netanyahu's in. Uh, recently, he gave a briefing to the uh, Israeli people where he tried to explain why the hostages, because this is one of those big issues that divides Israel, why the hostages aren't home, and all the Israelis are blaming him. So Netanyahu came up and said, no, it's Hamas's fault. Hamas is the one that sabotaged the talks. Hamas did this, Hamas did that. And he put up there as one of his exhibits, a document, um, a page of a document that um, the Israeli Defense Force seized in Gaza early on. This document, according to Seymour Hirsch, is maybe the most sensitive, highly classified document in the possession of the Israeli Defense Force. It's 12 pages. Um, it's uh, Hamas's plans, uh, why they did October 7th, what they hope to achieve, how they hope to achieve it. Um, this document is kept in the intelligence headquarters in a secure room. To get it, you have to have permission to go in there. You have to sign in. You're not allowed to take the document, make copies of the document. You have to read it. You can't take notes and leave. Somehow Netanyahu used his position as prime minister to get in there, get copies of the documents, bring them out. So A, he's under investigation for doing something similar. If you remember uh, in the post-Clinton era, Sandy Berger, the former national security advisor, went to the U.S. Uh, National Archives and tried to sneak out with documents stuck in his underwear. Um and he got in trouble for that. Well, this is what Netanyahu has done. Uh, illegally removed material and then published it without permission. Um, he's not the president of the United States. He doesn't have uh, authority to declassify at will. He has to get permission. He didn't get permission. But the other crime he committed is that he um, misrepresented this intelligence and deliberately misled the Israeli people. You see, this page that he, he quoted from the two pages that came after directly contradict the conclusions that he said, because he was talking about something that was uh, basically he was saying that Sinwar, the, the former head of Hamas, was going to flee Gaza to Egypt, take the hostages with him and then go to Iran, uh, that they had no intention of returning the hostages. And he's presenting it as if that is a statement of fact. But actually, that was just an option that was briefed to Sinwar. And the next two pages show that Sinwar rejected that, that he was going to stay in Gaza, the hostages would stay, and that they were looking for a deal to return the hostages. So this proves that not only um, is Hamas not responsible for sabotaging, that Netanyahu is personally responsible. This is a huge political nightmare for him. So these three things, t twice breaking the law and the other one uh, deceiving the, the Israeli people, Netanyahu is a very weak leader right now. The judge overseeing this had to seal the case because of the volatility, because if it gets out, it could lead to a civil war. That's how bad this is. So Israel is a nation that is fundamentally broken internally. Um, the, the Israeli president warned prior to October 7th that Israel is on the cusp of actual civil war because of Netanyahu's efforts to change the basic laws uh, altered the judiciary so he couldn't be held accountable for corruption charges. Now, it, you know, he fired, uh, you know, uh, Gallant, his secretary, minister of defense. That led to a near coup. The military was in an uproar. And now you have this. This is not a stable government. It's not a stable political environment. And there's nothing the Trump administration can do to change anything I just said. The Trump administration can continue to provide all the weapons they want to these weapons will not alter the outcome in Gaza, in southern Lebanon, in Yemen, or in Iran. Um, Israel, the best the Trump administration could do is put it on hospice care, hold its hand, give it a little bit of morphine. But Israel's dying, and that's the reality. So for all the people who are out there saying, oh, my, Elise Stefanik isn't going to change this outcome. Mike Huckabee isn't going to change this outcome. Marco Rubio isn't going to change this outcome. This is a reality that Trump is going to have to deal with. And again, Trump just sent Elon Musk to New York to meet with the Iran, Iranian ambassador to the United Nations. If all these Zionists out there uh, were going to you know, make it impossible for Gaza to exist, da, 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 um, the one thing that you would want is a war with Iran to destroy Israel's existential enemy. Why is Trump? with all these Zionists in his uh, administration, bending over backwards to avoid a war with Iran.
this, these are, these are, these are questions. And Tulsi Gabbard, the DNI pick, has enough integrity in her that she will report accurately the threat modules, the th- you know, the threats that exist, and the potential for peace. And I think she will report honestly about the potential for peace with Iran, the potential for uh, a deal that could bring about a ceasefire there. And then Trump's going to have to deal with the reality that y- you ain't bringing daddy back. You know, I mean, unfortunately, uh, daddy's got cancer. Daddy's in the hospital. And the best you can do is put him on hospice, hold his hand, visit him, give him a little bit of morphine. But daddy's going to die. Israel's going to die. And there's nothing Trump can do to save it. You know, that's so interesting when you lay it out like that. And I appreciate it because I think that when I've been looking at Trump's cabinet picks over the last week, right, I'm focusing in on the statements that they've made. And yes, someone like Mike Huckabee, where he's going, well, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. I'm immediately going to highlight that because I'm going, this is your guy who your ambassador to Israel, right? This is the message that you're sending at a time when the Palestinian people and their very existence is being targeted. But I think zooming out and kind of looking at, okay, you have all of these very clear Zionists in your administration. You're, you know, checking the boxes, arguably, from that $100 million donation from the Adelsons. But then at the same time, it's like, okay, what can all of these people do, right? What influence can they actually have? at a time where Israel has dug itself into this hole, because as we're talking about it, whether it's their ongoing bombardment of Gaza or Lebanon as well, it's like Israel's continuing to hurt themselves all around, both at home and abroad. And I did want to get into the situation in Lebanon, because I know that Israel reported one of the deadliest days of its ground offensive against Hezbollah on Wednesday, when it said that six of its soldiers were killed in combat near the border. Now, I know that there's been talk about a possible ceasefire agreement, but of course, when it comes to these agreements, it's it's always one of those things where it's like, okay, is Israel actually going to agree to this at the end of the day? And Then on top of that, Israel continues to bomb Beirut, flattening a building near one of the city's busiest traffic junctions on Friday. Just like in Gaza, they seem to be destroying and killing as much as they can. But it doesn't feel to me like they have any real strategy here, or I guess is the killing and the destruction as much as they can get away with their strategy. How do you see the situation in Lebanon? Well, with Lebanon right now, Israel had... Netanyahu in an act of desperation. Just so, P, again, we got to back out a little bit. I, I, I always hate because uh, people are looking for a straightforward answer, but it's never easy. These, these questions never have a simple answer. Um, Israel in 2022 and 2023, before October 7th, did um, large scale exercises. I think the 2023 exercise is called Chariots of Fire. And these were exercises that were designed to stress test the Israeli Defense Force in terms of its ability to defeat or counter um, simultaneous threats from all of Israel's enemies. So what would happen if everybody attacked Israel at once? What would happen? Um, And the interesting thing about that is they never thought that to include a scenario that Hamas attacking Israel and forcing Israel to send 300,000 troops into uh, Gaza uh, first. Um, So these, these plans that we're talking about didn't factor in Gaza or the West Bank beyond what they what the Israelis called an intifada type uprising that could be handled by tens of thousands of uh, police and military units, but not hundreds of thousands. That the vast majority of the Israeli defense force would be fresh, combat ready, and dispatched into southern Lebanon and to deal with um, these these other threats. And Israel lost every time. In each one of these exercises, Israel lost. Now, who knows this, knows this. And so here we are in a situation where Israel, it starts with Gaza, 300,000 troops deployed. They're exhausted physically. They're exhausted morally. Then the war goes up against Lebanon, escalation management. They get caught into a war of attrition. They're exhausted. Iran comes in, attacks, proves that the Israeli defense missile shield doesn't work. Ansrallah strangles the port of Elat and continues to attack Israel without you know, Israel being able to stop it. All of this goes on, and Netanyahu acts as if he can win the war in Lebanon, knowing that when they exercised it with fresh forces, he couldn't. So what what has changed? Again, we have to start with the, the, the foundational notion 
that Netanyahu isn't doing anything that he's doing for Israel. He's doing it for Netanyahu. This is about the personal political survival of Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, so things that wouldn't make sense if you're talking about the defense of Israel suddenly make sense when you talk about the desperation of a politically embattled Netanyahu. He does the dumbest thing in the world. He assassinates Hassan Nasrallah. You know, the day that Hassan Nasrallah was killed, he had just agreed to a ceasefire. See, Hassan Nasrallah was a pragmatic man. He wasn't looking for escalation. Um, he could be dealt with. He'd been in power since 1992. He knew all the major players. He was empowered to make decisions uh, that other lesser people couldn't make. For instance, decisions about a ceasefire, etc. He assassinated Hassan Nasrallah. He did an act of desperation, weaponizing a Mossad operation to infiltrate Hezbollah with pagers, uh, a, a, an act of terrorism like you wouldn't believe, but he implemented it, blowing up, taking more than a thousand mid-level uh, Hezbollah operatives off the, the playing board. Um, so there's, there's that. And then he believes that those two things will suddenly enable his military to win. So he goes into southern Lebanon with the military force. But he was wrong. Killing Hassan Nasrallah didn't stop Hezbollah. Hezbollah has redundancy, they have resiliency, and they have leadership. Uh, the pagers took out mid-level management, but Hezbollah, is, again, is a military organization that can absorb these casualties and continue to, to operate. Then he moved into southern Lebanon on ground where the... Uh, where Hezbollah has been preparing for 18 years to repel an Israeli attack. Every square inch of southern Lebanon is an ambush zone where, Le where the he Hezbollah is planned. What happens if Israel comes in here? What forces will we respond with, etc.? So the deeper Israel goes into southern Lebanon, the more they walk into, you know, continuous ambushes. Um, and Israel's losing. They were wrong. They, they, they gambled wrong. Um, Hezbollah exists. It's getting stronger. As we see every day, Hezbollah is starting to escalate. Remember, Israel bragged, we got rid of all Hez Hezbollah's uh, missiles and rockets. Really? What about the ones that just hit outside <laughs> of Tel Aviv yesterday? What about the ones that hit outside of Haifa? You get rid of those, and the ones are going to hit you tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and the day after that, and on and on and on, because it will never end. Hezbollah is prepared for 18 years for this. Israel's exhausted. They've got nothing left. So what they do now is they are going to continue to implement the policy, which they call, and I mispronounced the name, and I apologize, the Dahiwa Doctrine. Uh, basically, it's a, it's a policy of collective punishment that is derived from their actions in 2006 against the southern Beirut suburb of Dahiwa, which, Dahiwa, which has a heavy Shia uh, presence. And the idea is that you kill so many civilians that you turn the Lebanese people against Hezbollah to do so much damage against the civilian infrastructure of Lebanon that Lebanon rejects Hezbollah. Well, it didn't work in 2006. It hasn't worked in, uh, in, in Gaza. It's been implemented on a regular basis, 2008, 2014, 2016, on and on and on. Didn't work. And it's not working now. Um, all it does is certify Israel as a mass murdering, genocidal um, military with no moral compass governed by um you know, these, these, these criminals, uh, and they are criminals. It's, it's hurting Israel, but it's also hurting the people of Lebanon. But the policy is backfiring. Um, and Netanyahu now is struggling to come up with a solution. And the solution he's picked is to lie to the Israeli people, as I've already articulated. So um, I, I, I think that this was one of those gambits that failed, um, failed miserably and brought much more harm to Netanyahu, he is in a state of political existential crisis, and I don't think he's going to survive much longer. Yeah, it makes sense why he's calling Trump three times in uh, the first week after the election, trying to be as as stable as possible, I guess, for as long as he can. Now, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I do want to ask you while I have you here about the current situation relating to Ukraine. I know that there are reports of Kiev's defenses crumbling in the Donbass as Russian forces appear to be building up up around the Zaporozhye region with talks of a winter offensive. And I know that Trump is coming in, right? He's promised to end this war in 24 hours. He at least wants to end the war, which is not what Biden or Harris wanted. But 
at the rate that Kiev is going, both in the Donbass and with what's left of its incursion into Russia's Kursk region, how much bargaining power do you see the West as having? And is there any deal that you think that Russia would accept at this point? Well, it's interesting because we actually have some insight into what a Russian answer would be. Um, according to the media, uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz actually got a phone call with Vladimir Putin, and they discussed this. And Scholz laid out that he was looking for a, a piece. Of, he, you know, he starts off, you know, Germany will back Ukraine forever. We will continue to support, but we're we're looking for a negotiated end to this war. Um, and and Putin's response was very blunt. He said we too would accept, you know, looking for a negotiation, but it has to be based upon current realities, and those are that. Russia's winning this war. Russia will get all of its territory. Russia will dictate certain terms. Um, there won't be a NATO in, in Ukraine. That, you know. And then he said, and you only have yourself to blame. This is all about you. You're the one who created these problems. You know, Don't come to me. Don't blame me. You're the one who did this. You're the one who escalated. You did this. You're, and, he, and he just set the record straight. And if you've studied Russia, and I know you have, um, and you live there and you, you, know, you, you have some very valuable insights, uh, I mean, how fickle is the Russian government when the Russian president makes declaratory statements of this nature? Uh, do they, does, does Putin have a tendency the next week to contradict everything he said and go the exact opposite direction? Mm -hmm. Or once the Russian president says something, it's sort of chiseled in stone. Mm -hmm. And so now the question is, what would Putin say to Trump? We now know what Putin will say to Trump, the exact same thing he said to Schultz. Now, if Trump wants to dig in a little bit deeper and look for solutions, there's solutions to be had. But anybody who thinks that Donald Trump, I mean, because you've seen these crazy stories coming out about, uh, you know, they're going to freeze the conflict along the current line of contact, like like the Korean War, the demilitarized zone. And then the DMZ is going to be patrolled by British and NATO forces. Well, part of Ukraine will never have NATO forces allowed on its soil, don't you understand? Um, and that Russia would, you know, agree to certain things. No, <clears throat> Russia will have peace, but the peace is going to be dictated on terms that are favorable to Russia because Russia has won this war. Um, you know, I, I am a, you know, old school military analyst, uh, and I've been looking at this conflict for some time now. Um, I'm somebody that's very aggressive in my, uh, in my military thinking, because I'm trained to be aggressive. I come from a Marine Corps background where, you know, <laughs> we just put the pedal to the metal and, uh, and, 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 and such. Um, Russia has taken on an approach to this conflict that does not conform with traditional American military thinking. So it's very difficult for me sometimes to adjust my mind to accept the Russian reality, because I look at the situation in the Donbass and I'm seeing opportunities for rapid breakthrough, pincer operations, decisive action. But it would cost a lot of lives, cost an awful lot of lives. Ukraine is on, is, can be defeated today with a major push by the Russians. But you know all those casualties that the Ukrainian press is saying Russia is suffering, and they're not? Mm -hmm. Russia would suffer those casualties. If Russia did put the pedal to the metal, do the big arrow, they could easily lose 100,000 plus troops. Uh, because modern warfare is a horrible thing, and it's bloody, and um, and Russia's made a decision they're not going to do that. And so even as I sit there and I look at the degradation of Ukraine's military capacity, the weakening of their forces, uh, we have to take into account two things. One, the Ukrainian soldiers are tenacious. Every Russian commander I've talked to, every Russian journalist I've talked to, they all say the same thing. These guys fight hard. In scenarios where the Russians expected them to retreat or surrender, they instead choose to fight to the death, making the taking of a building, the taking of a tree line, um, a very difficult proposition, especially if you don't want to suffer casualties, which means that you have to pull back, bring in a lot of firepower, and then a slow, deliberate maneuver to achieve the outcome that's favorable to you, which is dead Ukrainians, not so many dead Russians. Um, when the Russians tend to rush this proposition, uh, move in aggressively, um, they lose tanks, they lose armored vehicles, they lose men. The Russians are going in a very slow, deliberate mode. And so 
when people say, what do you expect this winter? I expect the exact same thing to take place. Russia is in control of the battlefield and Russia will continue to advance in this slow, methodical measure, taking all of these positions, inflicting tremendous casualties on the Ukrainians, but not putting the pedal to the metal. So I see this winter offensive being more of the same, slow, deliberate uh, attack, until which time the Ukrainians collapse. And at that time, we might see something different. But right now, the Ukrainians are still fighting tenaciously. Um, I, I have to say that this is, um, from a military perspective, this is impressive. I mean, the, the courage that is uh, exhibited by the Ukrainians is mind-boggling. The tenacity, the dedication, um, something you wouldn't wouldn't uh, normally expect. Um, it's there. Um, and you also have to applaud the Russians because they're fighting this tenacious enemy and they're winning, they're prevailing. And that's a cautionary tale for anybody out there who thinks that NATO could uh, hook and jab with the Russians. Um, NATO can't hook and jab with the Russians, uh, not without learning some horrific lessons of war first. Um, uh, and uh, I don't want NATO to learn those lessons because that means dead people and we need to bring it into this conflict. And I think Trump is looking to do it. But again, he has to deal with reality. He has to deal with the reality. And so I think the Schultz conversation will be a very important learning point. And again, thank God for Tulsi Gabbard. Because if I were Donald Trump, I'd have her right next to me saying, what does this conversation mean? What Explain to me what, what Putin's saying. How does that translate into policy options for us? And I would also point out that um, he sent Elon Musk to talk to the United Nations ambassador to the United States. The, the, the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations. I would not be surprised if Elon Musk didn't um, pay a similar visit to a Russian ambassador or even make a trip to Russia and begin to have a conversation about how to bring this thing to an end. Trump is serious about wanting this war. He doesn't want to inherit this war. He doesn't want this to become uh, a driving issue or a defining issue. The revolution that Trump's trying to, 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 to achieve is a revolution inside America. Um, and he doesn't want to drag down by these potential of conflict outside of America. So I think we're going to see some interesting. One thing that I do predict is that he is going to name a special envoy to, uh, to Russia. And um, that person will have a large responsibility in terms of bringing it into this conflict and creating the conditions for normalized relations going forward. Um, but on the battlefield, we, we have to understand again, just like I said with Israel, the idea that you're going to breathe life into Israel, Israel's mortally wounded. Ukraine is mortally wounded. Um, you can sustain the life, um, you know, put them on oxygen, do whatever you want. Um, and that's what Biden's trying to do by pumping in $7 billion more work of, uh, military equipment, but you're not going to change the outcome. Um, this winter will be very bad for, for Ukraine, very bad for Ukraine. 90% of their thermal power production capacity is gone. There will be no electricity for tens of millions of Ukrainians, no running water, uh, which is fatal in wintertime, which means we could see a new influx of refugees into Europe at a time when Europe isn't ready, doesn't want, rejects the notion of Ukrainian refugees. And uh, with it, we can see a collapse of Ukrainian society, which brings about its own political realities. Um, there's talk in, in Ukraine now of having presidential elections, mm -hmm. which means that Zelensky won't be the president if they have presidential elections, which means Ukraine might be positioned itself for very dramatic political change to bring in people who can accept new realities and not go out and spout nonsense about victory plans and things of that nature. So let's see what, what happens with Trump. But um, I, um, I'm confident that Donald Trump is looking for a peaceful solution to this problem. I know, you know, there's this whole peace through strength thing that that's out there, but um, I think that's a lot of posturing. I think the reality is that he wants these conflicts to end so that he doesn't have to get called out on a bluff rather than saying, I'm going to do this. He, I'd rather he come in and say, well, I helped bring about the peace because my presence alone, I'll give him all that credit. If he wants to bluster and all that, <laughs> but as long as the war ends, Trump can take all the credit he wants. I don't care. But I want the war. I think the war needs to end, if nothing else, but for the Ukrainian people who yeah. have suffered so much. I mean, all these people that say they're pro-Ukraine, they support Ukraine, 
you do know that by providing seven billion dollars, all you're doing is condemning another hundred, two hundred thousand Ukrainians to death. That's it. It's not going to change the outcome. And I know it'll probably kill another fifty thousand Russians. And I know you don't care about the Russians, but the Russians care about the Russians, and the Russian people will never forgive you for what you've done. Um, and it has an impact on how we move forward with Russia going forward. This is a new administration. There's a chance to draw a line, create a new working relationship. Um, and show the Russians that they're serious about that. And the best way to do that is bring a realistic end to this conflict, one that recognizes the strategic defeat of Ukraine and the strategic defeat of NATO. And, um, and then you deal with that. You come up with um, new strategies that mitigate against that, but you, you can't change the reality of the outcome. Russia has won the war. Therefore, Russia does get to dictate to a large extent the terms of uh, conflict termination. This is one of those issues it's very difficult to talk about because of the emotional aspect of it. Um, I don't know if you've been watching things that I say, but uh, I, I've done a little bit of public speaking recently, and I consider myself to be um, a guy who has his act together in terms of um, you know emotions, etc. I can't get through a conversation about Hind Rajab without uh, breaking down. Um, it breaks my heart what happened to her and uh, her family. And that's just one of tens of thousands of children that have been slaughtered by Israel in its ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people. And I view it as genocide, not genocide like, not can, you know, maintaining the characteristics of something that could be otherwise known as genocide. It's genocide, straight up genocide. And so when you look at it from that perspective, especially one that's uh, sympathetic to the Palestinian causes, as I am, um, this is just bad news all around. I mean, this is, you know, the Biden administration lying, um, the, the the Trump administration just stacking the deck with people that are going to not just continue the lie, but expound upon it, uh, be openly supportive of Israel and its ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people. Um, and so one could be depressed. But I, I do come from a background where my job is to get out of the trenches and looking at the dead bodies and to pull back and take a look at the, the bigger picture and then take a look back at the bigger and then try and project that bigger picture over time. Um, two things. One, the reports that have been put out by the United Nations and seconded by Human Rights Watch and others um, is reflective of a global position. We need to understand that this conflict is more than just America. This is a conflict that's being looked at and evaluated by the world. And the world is primarily aligned around the notion that Israel is committing genocide and therefore Israel must be condemned for this. That's important. And that realization, that recognition impacts other things. To give you an example, what does Donald Trump think he's going to do? when he comes in? Does he think he's going to make a magic phone call to Saudi Arabia to bring things back to where they were on October 6th, 2023, where Saudi Arabia was on the cusp of normalizing relations with Israel and kicking off this uh, broad um, you know, geopolitical transformation that would be done under the auspices of the India, Middle East, European economic corridor, which Benjamin Netanyahu proclaimed is the greatest thing that's happened to the modern state of Israel in its history. I mean, that's where we're at. Normalization with the Gulf Arab states, Israel becoming this economic hub, uh, you, know, uh, you know, playing a significant role in defining the Middle East, Europe and, uh, and, and South Asian ec economies. This would be transformative for Israel. Um, that's over. That's done. It's never going to happen. Saudi Arabia has just said that there cannot be discussion of normalization with with Israel until there's a free independent Palestinian state whose capital is in Jerusalem. Um, how's Trump going to back that one away? And if he thinks that he has the same kind of access and influence with Saudi Arabia that he had back when he became president the first time around, if you remember early on in his administration, he flew to Saudi Arabia and uh, humiliated himself with the dance of swords, uh, you know, where he sat there and just stupidly looked like he was doing something, not realizing the Saudis are just mocking the living hell out of him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those days are done. Uh, MBS and Putin just had a, um, a very detailed conversation about the future. 
And it's a future where Russia and Saudi Arabia are cooperating together on a number of fronts, including the one which is most important to Saudi Arabia, and that's oil, OPEX+. Plus. There was some talk in the Trump administration, uh, or at least the wannabe Trump administration, about you know using oil as a as a leverage to separate Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, MBS and, and Putin just put a nail in that coffin. That's not going to happen. Saudi Arabia has started meeting with Iran and uh, and talking about strategic relationships. Uh, their militaries are starting to work together, not against one another. Again, the exact opposite of the trend that was happening with the Abrams Accord, Trump's um, you know centerpiece diplomatic achievement in the Middle East, which redefined the Middle East in the, along the lines that he and Jared Kushner thought were good. Um, the Abrams Accord is finished. It's done. And it's not going to be resurrected. It's a whole new world out there. Saudi Arabia was invited to BRICS. They haven't joined yet, but they're one of those nations that's on the cusp. They could decide to join. Uh, Iran is a member of BRICS. That means they're working with Russia and China. China, which, by the way, in the interim time between Trump's last administration and the one he's getting ready to put together, uh, brokered a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, making peace, not war. Um, it's a whole new world out there when it comes to the, the, the geopolitical reality that Trump's inherited. And so you can sit there and say, you know, Donald Trump can bring in people that are saying, we support Israel blindly. Elise Stefanik, the um, UN ambassador, Michael Huckabee, uh, the, U- the US ambassador, the UN, Michael Huckabee, the US ambassador to, uh, to Israel, his national security advisor is very hawkish. Uh, I mean, everybody would just, you know, Bobby Kennedy, even though he's not involved in national security policy, big time. Tulsi Gabbard, director of national intelligence, big time pro Israel. But here's the thing this isn't the Israel that Trump knew. This is an Israel that is defeated. And it's not just that they've suffered a strategic defeat. They are fatally injured. Israel will not recover from the injuries it has sustained. These, energy, these, these injuries are deep and they manifest themselves across the spectrum of what is normally associated with national existence. The economy, the one that Netanyahu was hoping to revive and, and, and make thrive through this India, Middle East, European economic corridor, took a $67 billion hit last year. It is on track to take a hundred billion dollar hit this year. It can't recover. No one's investing in it. Ports are shut down. Um, Export imports aren't coming in. It's sustained through artificial means alone. Israel has to artificially prop up its GDP by counting as income the costs associated with taking 60,000 settlers from the north and putting them in hotels. They're calling that income. Well, it's not really. We know what it is, uh, but it's fake. Everything about the Israeli economy right now is fake, artificial, and it won't recover. It can't recover. Israel militarily is devastated. They're not only not winning in, in Gaza, they're not winning in southern Lebanon. They're not winning against the Houthi. They're not winning against Iran. Um, they're actually in the opposite direction. They're losing. And the damage that's been done to the Israeli military is manifest both physically They weren't designed to take on a a war for a year long on this scope and scale. Uh, In terms of logistics alone, they've run out of spare parts for their tanks. Their Merkava 4s are, you know, it's difficult to keep them in the field. They've suffered so much damage, they don't have spare parts to repair them. So now a damaged tank is the equivalent of a destroyed tank. The same thing. They they had to stop selling Merkava 3s, the older version, because they have to keep them now to use them uh, because they're running out of Merkava 4s. The desertion rate in certain units has gone from 12 to 24 percent. 